Okay, you're all set. You can start, Taco. Thank you, Jorah. Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. This is from the ARPA Institute. We're having today a panel discussion by esteemed panelists. And the topic is on Lebanon. Just a few words about ARPA Institute. We have been working in Armenia for the last 30 years. And the main objective of ARPA Institute is to provide technical advice and also help advance science, education, technology, healthcare, and many other fields. The members of ARPA Institute are all experts in various fields and we provide our technical capabilities free of charge, of course. And we also, in addition to providing consultations and advice, we work with the different organizations in Armenia, all the institutes of the Academy of Sciences and also the universities. And we find out what is needed in terms of science, education, or all the other fields, and if we can achieve what is needed, and we try to implement it. We have several programs that are ongoing right now. One of them is our annual invention competition for young scientists in Armenia. And this is the 13th year that we've been doing it. We receive various inventions in different topics. We send it out to experts and the main guidance is each individual invention should be at least evaluated by three experts. And we get the evaluations and decide the winners. And then we award the winner $5,000 for the first, first place and 1,000 for the second. This is to encourage innovation and new products in Armenia, and also have the scientists think innovatively and creatively. We also have the annual, again, science fairs in all schools of Armenia. We work with the Ministry of Education, Science, Culture, and Sports to organize these science fairs. And we try to teach the teachers in Armenia how to organize a science fair and what is the objective of science fair and how, how they can guide the students in selecting their topic, in doing research, in uh, designing their experimentation, collecting data and evaluating the data. And in addition to that, they have to present their results in front of judges and uh, be able to identify the innovation that they provide in their project. This way they learn how to do scientific problems, how to solve scientific problems with a scientific manner. And uh, the winner uh, in Armenia of all the science fairs uh, will attend the International Science and Engineering Fair in the United States that is held everywhere. I mean, every year, uh, depending on uh, where they hold it, sometimes in Los Angeles, sometimes in other states. And the winner, uh, as I said, uh, of the science fair will participate in that international science fair. And we've been doing that for the last three years. And actually, one of the teams that was uh, attending the International Science Fair, uh, won fourth place, which is very encouraging for Armenia because they, they were not participating uh, originally. And we also have other projects like we provide, for example, instrument, in, uh, important instrumentation for re research and scientific advancement to the different institutes and the university. Like, for example, we have provided the first a modern sequencer in the Molecular Biology Institute. And they've been using that for so many years doing research and 
and provide and producing good papers. Uh, we we are currently um, working on completing a clean room, the first class 1000 clean room in Armenia. And the main objective there is to provide the scientists with a good clean environment so they can do very sensitive uh, experimentation. The, uh, the clean room itself has, is ready to operate. Uh, we are now working on providing more instrumentation so, so that scientists can do all the uh, necessary experiments within the, the clean room rather than going to other countries to do the experimentation. So these are the kinds of things we do. Um, and uh, we, of course, work by um, through your donations. So if you think that we are doing a good job, then please donate to ARPA Institute. Well, the only thing that we organize outside of Armenia are these panel discussions or presentations on various topics related to either Armenia or the Armenians in general. And um, of course, whatever the panelists or the presenters present, uh, it's not necessarily the point of view of the ARPA Institute. So um, we are very happy today to have this uh, important topic of discussion. And uh, we have a, a, a group of esteemed panelists uh, that will be introduced by our moderator, Dr. Viken Hovsepian, who, is, uh, who has a PhD on international relations from the University of Southern California, uh, specifically on US foreign formulation and decision-making, especially on the Middle East. He was, uh, he is from Beirut, uh, Lebanon, and is, is a community leader and an activist in the Los Angeles year, for years now. Dr. Osepian has held leadership positions in Armenian organizations and also as the chairman of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, Western USA, and, uh, and also a member of the ARF Bureau. Osepian was awarded the, uh, the Republic of, uh, by the Republic of Artsakh uh, with the medal, uh, with the Mkhitar Gosh medal presented by the president of Artsakh for his many services to the people and the Republic of Artsakh. He helped establish the Pan-Armenian Pan Council in the Western USA uh, by uh, organizing and putting together 24 organizations, different organizations to promote dialogue and coordinate activities within the Armenian community. And uh, he was the first moderator of this organization. Dr. Osepian has also had a long banking career and, in his, and is an advisor, is on the advisory board um, of Golden State Bank in California. Dr. Osepian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, depending on which time zone you're joining us from, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, ARPA, the ARPA team, uh, Hago Panosyan and Joraman Charyan uh, for putting together this panel and entrusting me the task of monitoring this esteemed panel uh, on this very timely, very complex, and indeed uh, very important topic uh, for what we call uh, the Armenian world. Uh, Lebanon has always been an anomaly of sorts uh, with its political system. Uh, its confessional political system has always intrigued analysts. Uh, its day-to-day -day politics has baffled, really, political analysts. And its uh, fragile economy has truly been an anomaly of huge proportions. Uh, for decades, analysts have predicted the collapse of the Lebanese system. But somehow, as the country has evolved and has come to the brink of total collapse, somehow the jigsaw puzzle has been reassembled, uh, albeit temporarily, uh, and the country has gone on. And the last two, three years, uh, 
is yet again telling us the story of a collapse. But will there be an absolute collapse this time? Uh, however one would define collapse, uh, or will it come back from the brink? Uh, the post-genocide uh, Armenian history basically uh, saw the birth of what we Armenians have called the centers of Armenian life. And along with Egypt, specifically um, Cairo and Alexandria and Syria, specifically with Aleppo, um, and to lesser extent, uh, Baghdad, Iraq, Lebanon became uh, arguably the most prominent center of Armenian life. And in this era, the post-genocide era, the Armenian community of Lebanon uh, has been more than just a community. It has been indirectly through its manpower and through its intellectual um, input, um, it has been sort of an architect of other communities, really, because its manpower has emigrated to different communities of the uh, new world, so to speak. Uh, and it has been part and parcel of the fabric of these new communities. So now with the pressures of Lebanese uh, environment being what they are, the Armenian community obviously is affected hit by many ways, uh, uh, economic, political, and this time, uh, those these, these pressures, these hits seem uh, to be insurmountable to a certain extent, but are they? Um, and um, so today's panel uh, is about Lebanon, but it's mostly the vantage point, obviously, is the Armenian community and how all of this affects the Armenian community and Armenian life in general. How does it affect diaspora? How does it affect us and so on and so forth? So uh, without much further delay, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce the first panelist, uh, Dr. Samar Isa. And if you receive, um, uh, the invitation, basically you have uh, seen the bios of uh, the esteemed panelists. So I will not go um, through the whole uh, bio, except to say that Dr. Isa is an assistant professor of finance, business analytics and leadership in the department of business administration at St. Peter's University in New Jersey. Uh, she is also the director of the Center for Leadership Studies there. Um, she has been uh, extensively engaged with corporations, U.S. corporations, multinational corporations, the United Nations, and uh, life in Lebanon itself, uh, specifically dealing with economics and the country's economy. So without, uh, without much... Uh, Delay, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Isa for her presentation. Samar? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very, very happy and thank ARPA for having me here to discuss some challenges of the Lebanese economic crisis and especially within the uh, Armenian community. And I hope to provide some possible economic solutions. Uh, I know it's very hard, not very promising, but I'll try my best. Um, so, uh, as you all know, um, Lebanon is really going through uh, some serious challenges, serious economic challenges with high inflation, unemployment, and plummeting currency. And the cost of living has become really too high for many Lebanese people. Um, so before I start um, discussing, I would like to just share some indicators for Lebanon as of February 2023, and the data that I'm providing is actually from the World Bank and Trading Economics. Uh, the GDP growth is negative 43%. The inflation rate is 365%, which is um, higher than Zimbabwe. We even surpassed Zimbabwe and we're second after Venezuela. And the way we're going, it seems we're bracing towards the first place. 
uh, unfortunately. The unemployment rate, the official one is 42%. The public debt is 170% of GDP and um, the consumer price index ranked uh, 26 among, it ranked first among 26 Arabic countries. Um, with all that, of course, comes corruption. So it's all driven by corruption, as we know, and a few other things. But um, so uh, again, Lebanon did uh, rank 149 out of 180 uh, in a corruption index published by transparency.org. Um, as you can see from this data and from what's happening, the crisis did have a significant impact on Lebanese people. They're just struggling with access to basic needs, um, such as food, medicine, uh, fuel, etc. But the Armenian community in specific, like other minorities in, in the country, is facing really a range of other economic or more severe economic challenges, in my opinion. For instance, the high levels of unemployment in the country did affect Armenians more than others because most of them work in sectors uh, that are um, really have been hit by or the hardest by the crisis, such as tourism, hospitality, and retail. And we know, unfortunately, that Armenians face some kind of discrimination as well. So again, really, in terms of unemployment, the, the Armenian community is hit hard. Uh, also, um, the um, like most Lebanese, Armenians rely on remittances from family members abroad. And the crisis has made it even more difficult for those living abroad to send money uh, due to the banking system, et cetera. So, um, and many as well, many businesses in Lebanon have closed down due to the economic crisis. But for the Armenian community, that's even tougher because many work or own small businesses and have been forced to shut down. So all of this really show how much Armenians are struggling in Lebanon economically. And the reasons behind the crisis, as you all know, are related to political instability, corruption, mismanagement, uh, and external shocks, etc. cetera. Um, being an expert on economic crisis specifically, I'll just address the economic aspect of the crisis. Um, so the question that I always think about or whoever looks at the crisis think about is, did this happen really overnight? Um, well, the answer is, of course, no, right? We all know that this financial meltdown is a consequence of so many years of corruption and mismanagement. Um, but I'll, maybe uh, you'd be interested in knowing some of the chronological events, um, chronological like financial events that led to the crisis. Um, and at the end, I'll provide some possible solutions. Uh, first, um, after the 1975 civil war, tremendous government debt was accumulated and the government was borrowing and borrowing occurred with no constraints and a, at a high interest rate. It kept increasing, reaching even 21%. And, um, and I always thought like, why did the country borrow so much or how did the country borrow th so much? And the thing is that um, Lebanon, really used a kind of what we call a Ponzi scheme, which means um, officials and the central bank essentially borrowed new money to pay existing debt obligations at higher and high, higher interest rates. So to service their debt and pay the interest rate that they owe, they borrowed even more money. And right now, as I said before, the public debt is 170% of its GDP. So there's no way the, the, the government can pay back its public debt. Um, in 2011, 2011, um, a lot changed as a result of some political controversy controversy. Uh, the government, the country had budget deficits that surged to new heights. Uh, balance of payments, which is exports minus imports, the difference between exports and imports really hit new lows. And in 2016, the banks here, it's where the banks offered extremely high interest rate for dollar deposits and even higher for for Lebanese pound deposits. And I remember a couple of years or three, four years ago, some somebody from, from Lebanon, a family member said, you have to invest in Lebanon. We're getting 17% on government bonds. And I was, there is no way a government can pay that amount. Like there's something's wrong for sure. And clearly the, that was a sign for what, what we're suffering now or what Lebanon is suffering and going through. 
And, um, but these high interest rate that were paid resulted in um, a bit, an influx of dollars and Lebanese pounds back into the economy. So the Central Bank of Lebanon basically introduced this approach um, in order to bring back some money, but it was the reason, in my opinion, for Lebanon's current state. And in 2019, you all may know how the whole um, crisis um, kind of collapsed, which is Lebanon looked to tax WhatsApp calls. Uh, we all use WhatsApp, right? It's free everywhere. In Lebanon, they, were, they tried to tax uh, WhatsApp calls. And um, just to give you a quick idea, the Lebanese government has, the taxing system in Lebanon has always favored uh, the richest, right? So that really hit the, the people. Um, and as a result, we had uh, civil unrest. And, um, and then eventually um, many people just, um, um, started to really withdraw their money from banks. The banks did not have enough money, enough deposits in their bank and the Lebanese pound collapse. And in March of 2020, the country defaulted for the first time on a debt payment, on a public debt payment. Then the port explosion happened, the pandemic and so on. All of that exacerbated the economic issues. And here we are in 2023, paying the price for all of this since 1975, and more specifically since 2011. Um, now to go back to 2003, to 2023, as of now, in my opinion, the economic situation in Lebanon is not hopeful. Uh, we see no easy or close solutions. Um, the serious issue is that Lebanon's economy has been heavily dependent on services, particularly banking and finance, tourism, and of course, remittances from the Lebanese diaspora, as I mentioned before. Um, since we have a handicapped government, an impaired banking system, uh, an international community that kind of gave, us, gave up on us, I feel we are left off with diaspora engagement. And um, the, the most effective means for the country um, to raise funds throughout the past few years was through its diaspora. Uh, the World Bank estimated the remittances and flaws in Lebanon at $11 billion in 2022, which is around 38% of the country's GDP. And um, Lebanon in, in the world, Lebanon was ranked 24th largest recipient of remittances in the world. And, However, when we think of, of diaspora and diaspora engagement, um, we think of if they can help with finding a solution to the Lebanese crisis. Uh, I think um, the answer is no. However, they can make a difference. So the diaspora can make a difference. Um, we have to go through, we have to go beyond remittances and find some kind of systemic engagement for the government. And uh, recently, Dr. Uh, Alexander Javorkian and I launched an international online uh, Lebanese um, diaspora survey based on his Armenian diaspora survey. And, um, and a lot of interesting, we got a lot of interesting results, but uh, out of the 125 respondents said actually they are willing to help in a way of, or another. So the idea now comes is that people are ready to help. They are ready to be engaged. Um, how to better target the diaspora. Um, um, I think one idea could be the government bond or diaspora bond, which is um, these are government debt securities um, with investors drawn from the country's expatriates and could generate billions of dollars globally in annual investment. Of course, what I'm going to mention now are long-term plans after gaining trust in the government and in the banking system. So uh, it's kind of the third layer of finding a solution, but we need to find a, we need to have a government first, a president, and then go, go beyond to kind of uh, experience these uh, options of economic solutions. Um, another way for Lebanese diaspora to help is by creating uh, some kind of markets for products manufactured in Lebanon and strengthened bilateral trade flows. And during the crisis, a lot of people have done that. And uh, it seems it's, it's growing. There's a lot of potential. Um, we have to remember that the Lebanese hyperinflation or the, the collapse of the Lebanese pound has benefited those who have U.S. dollars, whether inside or outside of the country. So basically, it kind of makes a difference and people can, um, people outside of Lebanon can, can create those markets uh, 
um, since we have cheap labor uh, and so on, et cetera. Another option exists through diaspora direct investment. Um, again, no one wants to invest in, in a country like Lebanon at this point. However, uh, if once we have some gained some kind of trust, um, this would be the place where people can make some money, so it should be attractive. Um, it's the diaspora direct investment refers to direct investment from companies connected to diasporas in productive activities. Um, but again, we need to regain trust in the central bank as well, not only uh, the government, we need to gain trust in the central bank of Lebanon, uh, local commercial banks uh, can, for instance, set up branches in the diaspora following success successful examples from China and India to tap the diaspora capital. But um, how would I deposit my money um, in a Lebanese branch right here if I know the government or the banks or the central bank are kind of uh, corrupt, corrupt, right? So the, the definitely the first part is to gain some trust and the restructuring of the banking system, but also the, a lot can be done for the banking system outside of Lebanon to support the banking system in Lebanon. Um, again, another idea is the gas discoveries. The, the, this, these could represent an opportunity for diaspora engagement amid the mistrust in the Lebanese government. Uh, there will be much scope and need for the diaspora to be part of the anticipated gas extraction. Um, we need right policies and focus, but at least we can trust the diaspora more than we can trust the government. So they can, there can be some means to revive the economy and limit Lebanon's dependence on foreign energy imports uh, by providing some kind of opportunity, uh, investment opportunity for the diaspora. And um, finally, I'm going to say that um, the Lebanese diaspora has valuable expertise in various fields, uh, highly educated, uh, wealthy, etc. And the Armenian community within the Lebanese um, diaspora, even um, in specific. Uh, so, and these can include, include finance, technology, entrepreneurship, and so on. And they can provide technical assistance and, and expertise. From the survey that results that I mentioned before, we saw that the diaspora engagement and technical assessment, uh, assistance has moved up after the crisis and people are really re ready. And I've looked at a few um, nonprofit organizations who are offering this and it's, it's moving in the right direction, but again, it's not systematic, it's individual attempts and um, it has to be at a bigger scale and a more organized, inclusive way. Um, the diaspora can also advocate for reforms in the Lebanese banking sector and the economy as a whole by engaging with their uh, local and national governments and international organizations. Um, so this is kind of what I have in general about the crisis. Um, I can say that I'm skeptical. The solution to the crisis will not be an easy one, uh, but I do believe that diaspora um, engagement opportunities might, might partially help solve the current crisis. Um, as the people inside Lebanon are really going through um, some hardships and it's not very easy for them to make a change, um, but the diaspora can probably uh, assist in transforming some domestic institutional and, um, arrangements. Um, thank you. Thank you, Samar. So uh, the way we will conduct uh, these um, panels, feel free to uh, ask any questions in the chat room, and I will try to relay them uh, to Dr. Issa. Uh, and then uh, same goes for the other panelists, of course. In the meantime, I will uh, leave it up to Jora to monitor the Facebook aspects in case there are any comments or questions on that end, because I don't have access to the Facebook uh, uh, element. Unfortunately for the Facebooks, they can only watch. They cannot raise any questions. Okay, okay, fine then. Yeah. Uh, so I will um, ask the following, Samar. In your presentation, obviously you touched upon this, but if you could just expand a little bit more. Um, we, we all know it's been said, and uh, there's a lot of controversy around this, that Lebanon has per capita uh, the most refugees, correct? in the country. Uh, and But as many people have come in, refugees have come in, uh, a lot of Lebanese have left, emigrated, 
and they form what we call nowadays uh, the diaspora, Armenians being part of that. Um, so how do you see those large numbers, uh, the influx and also the exits? Uh, how do you see this uh, impacting the economy? I mean, you put a positive spin on it all, saying, well, the diaspora is, uh, of course, uh, uh, can be uh, a, a great help to the economy and so on. But how do you see all this playing out? What's the net net result of all of this, all of, all of this emigration and so on? Sure. First, I'll answer um, the the aspect, the immigration aspect. So for sure, the situation is very bad and hundreds of thousands, no one really has the exact number, but hundreds of thousands of people lost, uh, left the country. And this outflow of skilled labor is really detrimental to the long term success of the country's economy. And um, and also these large numbers of immigrants can put strains on public services and infrastructures such as healthcare, education, transportation, et cetera. And we've been seeing that people are saying they're not finding good doctors, they're not finding, there are no teachers, et cetera. In terms of refugees, the difference is that although we have an influx of refugees, refugees do not help the, the economy whatsoever. They kind of act as, um, as a uh, as a as a band aid to the government or to, to the economy and in a, in a way that they are getting a lot of aid in U.S. dollars and they've been spending this money in the country but they're not helping in investment or growing the economy itself. Um, so they're actually a burden because they're spending which which is letting which is allowing kind of the the prices to keep on increasing and to have higher and higher inflation. Uh, and uh, and at the same time, the um, they're not helping the economy in any way. Uh, over the long term, this will be really, really detrimental. I believe the the the, the large numbers of immigrants. So, if if you were to um, just offer uh, top line some solutions to where the banking system should go, or what are some of these uh, banking solutions, and how is this diaspora? Uh, related to all that? Can, how can it be related to some solutions? What would you say? Would you have any suggestions? Uh, I think there are a lot of economic and financial solutions that can take place, but of course this can only happen after some political reform. So I could mention a few and I did touch base on, um, for instance, um, banks, um, uh, op local banks uh, opening branches in, in the diaspora and so on. Um, again, this all seems like a surrealistic if taking the political considering the political situation right now, but hoping that things are going to go in the right direction and things are going to be better. Uh, we can think of, for instance, the first one for the government could be that restructuring. So the Lebanese government can work with international creditors to restructure its debt in a way that makes it more sustainable and manageable. And that could involve reducing interest rates, extending repayment schedules. We can't keep on defaulting on public debt for sure. And some kind of debt relief measures. Uh, in terms of the banks, um, uh, the, the Lebanese government, once we have one, can work with the central bank to restructure the banking sector, um, which is characterized by the presence of many small and medium-sized banks. But this could involve measures um, such as mergers and acquisitions, recapitalization of weak banks, new regulations, and so on. The way the banks are functioning right now, they're mostly closed and no one can, can withdraw their money from them. They're not really banks. They, they suffer from even the most um, fundamental characteristics of a financial institution. So this whole um, banking system, impaired banking system needs to be restructured. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Doris Magirdichan is asking uh, along the lines of what you already uh, covered, of course, but she's asking how about uh, the foreign banks opening branches in Lebanon to receive diaspora money? 
that's that's very interesting. Um, that's a very valid question. Well, just so that you know, a lot of major banks in Lebanon, such as Bank Audi, um, Blom Bank, and France, and they have a huge part of their, no one knows that, but um, they are part of Western banks as well. So Goldman Sachs owns 25% of a certain bank, um, and especially Bank of America and Goldman Sachs do own a large percentage of that. And I agree that we need an alternative to the existing um, banking system. No one, no one trusts these banks anymore. So there could be some kind of um, reconsolidation instead of having so many banks to be a few banks working with Western banks to kind of gain some trust. And um, uh, I think I think the problem is that we don't have right now in Lebanon some qualified officials who can really and it's it's somebody else is going to talk about that but um, it's a it's very uh, diverse opinions and that's the problem so but I do think that it's an idea to just have some kind of um, ban um, western bank and it's happened in many many other places where you have branches of HSBC or uh, or or Wells Fargo or Chase or whatever bank you want to mention um, functioning in a foreign country. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of questions related to um, uh, corruption and so on. What I will do, I will defer these questions to later on because our other panelists, uh, specifically Dr. Kishish and Dr. Sanjan, are going to touch upon elements of this. Uh, and of course, uh, we all know that corruption is not just economic in nature, it's very much intertwined with political aspects. So I will leave those to the end discussion. Uh, and what I'm going to do now, I'm going to introduce Dr. Keshishian. Thank as you very second. much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Summer. Uh, we're going to uh, have Dr. Keshishian as our second panelist. Uh, and of course, um, like I said, if you receive the invitation, you have the full bio. I urge you to follow that. But uh, he is, uh, 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 Dr. Keshishan is a political scientist uh, and has been formerly with uh, the Rand Corporation in LA as an analyst. He is a non-resident senior fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in Riyadh. Uh, he is the author of uh, some 19 books. Uh, the most recent ones uh, in 2022 uh, is, uh, is uh, a piece, uh, of course, uh, entitled Armenians and Jews Confront the Genocide. This was in the Palgrave International Handbook of Israel. Uh, and uh, he, uh, in 2023, his book came out, uh, the book about Oman. I urge all of you, if you haven't, um, looked at it uh, to uh, get it and 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 uh, look at it. It's an interesting book. Uh, and so, without uh, much delay, I'd like to invite Dr. Keshishian for his presentation. I'm very sorry. I just want to apologize. I have another meeting. It's going to be for an hour and a half. I was very interested. It was very interesting to to listen and participate. I hope I can finish it sooner. So I can join, but it was a previous commitment. I do apologize and thank you very much for having me. I'll try to log in as quickly as I could, as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Keshishan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I am uh, glad to be with you. Uh, I am in Beirut, as uh, actually in the mountains of Lebanon. Uh, so I've been here for about uh, 11 years now. And I follow events in this country painfully. Uh, this country is a painful place to be now. And uh, it's, it's no longer fun to be here, to be perfectly honest with you. What we have just heard from Dr. Isa is a very good illustration of the troubles of this country. And if I sound pessimistic in my remarks, uh, you will only appreciate that more after what I'm about to tell you. I've divided my talk into three points. I wanna concentrate on the political landscape of Lebanon, then talk about the social changes that are taking place here. And then the third part is talk about the future of Armenians, if any, in this country. The political situation is a mess. 
And I am being very polite. I'm measuring my words. Mess is a neutral term. It doesn't even begin to describe the chaos that rules over this country. Everyone is against everyone else. No one has any solution about any subject. There is no water, no electricity. The garbage is piling in the streets. Everybody is happy because $8 billion are transferred every year from diaspora uh, Lebanese. That makes people survive. People go out on Sunday to restaurants and have a great time, enjoy each other's company. And then the cycle of misery restarts on Monday morning. It's a real mess. Why is the situation like that? Well, after 100 years of independence, the Lebanese have failed to build a state. This is not a state. It has the appearances of nationhood, but as we all know, Lebanon is a, is a collection of nations. It's not a single one. There are different peoples here, even though they all are Lebanese citizens, they have little or nothing in common. People do not really like each other in this place. People do not consider that everyone is equal under the law because people make their own laws as they go along. So therefore, after 100 years, what we have is a total division. We have today a division, if you would like, between Haririism or political Haririism, which has been built up for the past 30 years, and what, for lack of a better term, Aounism has come which has supervised over the collapse of the, of the country. After 2006, the real tragedy occurred when Aoun and his cohorts entered into a permanent alliance with Hezbollah, which is a, a stooge of Iran in this country, whose primary objective is to create the Wilayat al-Faqih or a, or a branch of the Wilayat al-Faqih on the Mediterranean. And of course, the animosities have increased tremendously. There are deep divisions, as I said. These divisions are tribal, they are clannish, they are religious, in addition to being political and economic. The October 2019 revolution, or the Thawra as they call it here, potentially could have made a change in the country, but the power of the, of the institutions that run this place was so strong that they crushed the 2019 revolution by relying on the security forces and the army to actually put an end to whatever aspirations the Lebanese had. So therefore, no one should really be surprised that we have reached this point. If we look at the social landscape, what do we have? The Lebanese are famous for saying that they like the, the collective uh, learning, living together, as they say in Arabic. Uh, somehow, this is, uh, this is a level of tolerance that is unavailable elsewhere in the Middle East, in the Arab world in particular, which is not true at all. Other Arabs are far more tolerant than the Lebanese are, even though we give the impression that we are more tolerant than they. There is today a kind of division at the social level between the majority of people and law and order authorities who mistake all kinds of legal prerogatives to go ahead and rule over the country. Entire sections of society have been abandoned. Dr. Isa has mentioned, for example, the economic issues but when you have 80% of people today living below the poverty line, when you have actually individuals who will not have dinner tonight, and they will go to bed hungry in this country. Now, those of us who were born and raised in this place, remember and, and, and recall a totally different country. Today, we are at a point where obviously the social system has collapsed. The only way these people are surviving is because non-governmental organizations, both local and foreign, are providing, actually they provide food for these people so that they don't starve to death. And 
quite a few people in remote areas of the country, especially in the north, in the Akkar region, people actually have been seen eating from garbage bins. So we should not be surprised by the social collapse that has taken place. Now, of course, she also mentioned very correctly a very important dimension of what has happened in Lebanon. And I think Dr. Hovsepian also hinted at this, the fact that you have a whole bunch of refugees here. In fact, half of the population of Lebanon is considered to be refugee now. The other day, the Cardinal of the Maronite community, Cardinal Rai, has publicly stated that there were 2.4 million Syrians alone living in, in Lebanon. Let me repeat that number. 2.4 million Syrians alone. We're not counting here the Palestinian refugees. We're not counting the 700,000 or so foreign workers who have legitimate employment opportunities in this country. And you can imagine that, you know, the parity now between natives and non-natives, or if you will like citizens and non-citizens has almost at 50-50. And the government, the government is not addressing any of these issues. To their credit, I give them credit for this, they are excellent at printing money. Every day, there is more and more money that has been introduced in the country. Uh, GDP, as, as the numbers that we've heard, is already in the tank. We will not even have 0.5% uh, GDP growth this year. And the, the emigration that has started in 2017. Of course, Lebanon has always been a country of immigrants, but in 2017, let me give you some numbers. In 2017, 25,000 Lebanese have left the country. By 2019, 60,000 left. Last year in 2022, 200,000 have left. And this year, you can expect even higher numbers. Now, the third part of my talk. And before I forget, I want to mention something about this demographics question, because this is a controversial issue. And this week, the sitting prime minister, Prime Minister Mikati, in an interview to Al Shadi television, let it be known that apparently there's some kind of study that someone has done, even though we don't know who, we don't know uh, what, what it contains, that the number of Christians in Lebanon is only 19.4%. And there is a huge controversy going on the whole week. People saying, no, 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 this is not true because in the last parliamentary elections last year, about 34, 34.4% of all the voters were apparently Christian. So therefore the numbers cannot be 19.4%. Uh, uh, but again, uh, this, this really uh, ties in to my third area of, of uh, discussion here. And I want to raise this issue aware of the fact that some of the things that I'm gonna say is gonna be very upsetting to a lot of Armenians. Do Armenians have a future in Lebanon? No, they don't. I'm very sorry to say that. At one point in history, about 30, 40, 50 years ago, the number of Armenians, whatever it was, 300, 400,000 in a population of 4 million, the number of Armenians in this country was far less important than the value that they added to the society. Armenians were valued as human beings, as people who could, who could help the society. They were physicians, lawyers, engineers, you name it. The creme de la creme, if you would like, of this country. Today, not only because of immigration and natural death, what is left of the Armenian community is so small now, the numbers are so small, uh, even though people tell you they don't know the numbers, this is not true. Everybody knows the numbers. Nobody has the courage to actually talk about the numbers. And everybody wants to make sure that dead people who have been dead for some time, but who have never been removed from the registers, then are still voting in various parliamentary and municipal elections, uh, somehow these people really matter, but the reality is something else. So the prime minister may have actually helped Christians awaken. So the Armenians fall into this trap as well. And they have to be very aware of the fact that as individuals, some of us are praised for what we do, but as communities, uh, whether it is political, religious, social, we have become 
totally marginalized, except for the Tashtak party and its leader, Hagop Pakradunian, we hardly see any Armenian leader on television or in the media. Uh, nobody asks whether Armenians have any opinion about this or that. What do they think about these issues? Do they, they never participate in political programs on television. They, we, we are absent from the scene. Now, let me close with two points. One, there was a mistake made some years ago about the fact that the Tashnak, Tashnak party has associated itself with Hezbollah and the Aounis. In my humble opinion, this was a mistake because Armenians have always been proud of their neutrality during the civil war and afterwards. But those days are gone. We are essentially as Armenians perceived by the vast majority of Lebanese, both Muslim as well as Christian to be part of a particular political establishment. And that particular political establishment happens to be the Auni Hezbollah Alliance. That's one point. In my opinion, we're gonna pay the price for this down the line. The final point that I wanna make, I wanna close with a call for relevance. Whether or not we as a community have the wherewithal to actually have strategists who can provide insights to decision makers, even if our decision makers are not interested in listening to what the strategists have to say. And I think that there are enough Armenians in the diaspora who can add value to the future of the community in Lebanon and throughout the Middle East. I am very, very saddened by what's happening to the Armenian community in Lebanon. As I said at the very beginning, I've been here now for 11 years, and even I am thinking of coming back home. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keshishian. Um, a question that obviously uh, is everyone, in everyone's mind is that uh, the, the community now is in fact, the Armenian community that is, is in fact, uh, uh, the, the, the subject of many, many currents. Uh, there is a lot of uh, intrinsic and also external uh, issues facing it. There is an existential uh, issue going on, uh, but isn't that really relative? I mean, we are all used to uh, the Armenian community in Lebanon being what it is, as you uh, pointedly described some 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And are we lamenting the fact that it's not what it once used to be, or is it, is the threat, uh, as you put it, absolute? Uh, well, um, I don't have a crystal ball, so I cannot really answer that question. I don't know what's going to happen down the line. I am pessimistic. The reason why I'm pessimistic is because our numbers are small and our relevance has become tangential, as I said. We don't have voices in, except for Hagop Pakradunian and the Tashnak party leadership, which participate once in a while in these discussions, uh, very rarely, even... even uh, Deputy Pakadunian's appearances are very limited just for the holidays and as a token once or twice a year. I think that our numbers now speak for themselves. Too many Armenians have left Lebanon. Let's face it. There are too many Armenians left left and most of them are not gonna come back. How many of you who are listening to me right now or participating in this panel discussion are even thinking of going back to Lebanon? I bet no one. And as I acknowledge myself, I'm even thinking of going back home. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, I cannot stay like this uh, uh, 
And a lot of people are, are doing this, are saying the same thing. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it doesn't look good at this point. And we should not really bury our heads in the sand, assuming that something is going to change or something is going to, something better is going to happen down the line. Um, nothing happens by accident in life. If you want something done, you have to make it yourself. It's uh, also uh, something of relevance to the Armenians and the Armenian community. You came back, at least. At least Nap time, yeah, let's go upstairs. Somebody yeah. okay, needs Abby. to go meet. Go take a nap, and when you wake up, we're Gary, going to go Gary to Artinian, see the monkey. Please, please mute yourself, Gary Artinian. OK, so as I was, Jora, can you please uh, mute? Uh, the person who's not on mute and is okay. So uh, the question that I was uh, about to ask was something of relevance to us as Armenians uh, has always been the role of Turkey in Lebanon and in general, of course, in the Middle East, but specifically uh, in Lebanon and how that impacts, if any, in, in any ways, uh, the Armenian community, our interests, and so on and so forth. And uh, do you think that has any impact on the alliances that the Armenian community, the parties, and so on and so forth um, would establish with any uh, of the forces uh, in Lebanon, the political forces, that is? Uh, that's an excellent question, uh, Dr. Hovsepian, because obviously, because Turkey is a Sunni country, there is an assumption that the Lebanese Sunnis are going to favor Turkey and work with Turkey as much as they can. And in fact, in the north of Lebanon, especially in Tripoli, uh, there are several Turkish NGOs that are very active, providing all kinds of assistance. This goes back several years now. And the Hariri family have been very close to uh, several Turkish governments received assistance and so on. And last week, after, about two weeks ago, after the earthquake, uh, Lebanese uh, defense forces dispatched about 40 or 50 rescuers and they've rescued a whole bunch of people, even though about 40 Lebanese, a little less than 40 Lebanese who used to live in Gaziantep and in Marash and so on and so forth, uh, most of them died, of course, and they, they repatriated some of these, some of these poor, victims. But I, I want to add something else too about Turkey. Turkey has been very smart in Lebanon. Um, you know that the United Nations interim force in Lebanon has been here since 1978, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and it has a significant Turkish contingent attached to UNIFIL, which means every six months, several hundred Turkish soldiers come here and serve in the south of Lebanon to protect Israel from Lebanon. So therefore, that presence is, is very important as well. And because Turkey is so close, a lot of Lebanese, uh, whether Sunni or non-Sunni, including Christians, go to Turkey for vacations. It's cheap, relatively speaking. You don't need a visa for a Lebanese passport holder to go to Turkey. So therefore, you can enter Turkey very easily. Of course, it's true for, for Armenia as well. A lot of uh, Lebanese uh, now can, all, all Lebanese can, can now go uh, to Armenia without a visa too. So, so therefore, you have a lot of facilities that the Turks have provided. And, and this has helped the Turkish presence in Lebanon to strengthen itself. But make no mistake about the fact that in the past, our large presence in this country made that the Armenian genocide was something that was respected, acknowledged. The Lebanese government has acknowledged the Armenian genocide. It is this, one of two Arab countries that have formally recognized the genocide, the other one being Syria. So therefore, we had some kind of a voice here. We've withered that away. We, we've, uh, we have not invested uh, in that. And, because we left the country in large hordes, we've lost whatever we had planted. The seeds that we planted did not produce the fruits that we anticipated or our previous leaders anticipated. 
Okay. Uh, Sylvie Terzagian has a question, which I'm going to take the liberty to expand it a little bit. Uh, she was asking specifically about a possible division of the country between Turkey and Israel. Uh, I'm going to expand that question and say, do you see the possibility of a Lebanon uh, that uh, is eventually fragmented into geographical pieces with different, uh, you know, uh, uh, different elements in Lebanon controlling different, uh, I mean, we've all always known about the West and the East and so on and so forth of Beirut. And we've known that there are certain, uh, the South of Lebanon is typically um, uh, controlled by the Shia and the specifically Hezbollah and so on and so forth. But do you see some, I mean, this has come up uh, time and time again about different uh, cantons, different uh, sections of Lebanon being uh, the, in a confederate system of some sort. Do you see a possibility such as that? Well, uh, Sylvie Terzakian is reading my mind. Uh, actually, I wrote a, an essay in foreign affairs, in foreign policy, excuse me, in foreign policy a few years ago, in which I argued that the only solution for Lebanon is partition. It's not going to happen, of course. I'm aware of that uh, because the Lebanese have essentially surrendered the country to Hezbollah. Why would Hezbollah accept partition when it wants the whole country? And it is, in fact, literally dominating the country as we speak. Uh, partition would be perfect, and partition would answer the question uh, that Prime Minister Mikati has raised this week by saying that the number of Christians are so small. Uh, and he is essentially telling the Christian community, don't assume that you're going to have the presidency of the republic, the commandership of the army, and the governorship of the central bank for too long. The, all three of them are Maronite held, by the way. So if you continue like this, there will not be enough Lebanese. And one of these days, we're going to take these three positions from you. So therefore, partition would presumably mean that Christians would be in majority, perhaps, in Mount Lebanon. Again, as I said, this is, this is uh, wishful thinking on my part and on the part of a lot of people. And of course, people are now talking about a divorce between the communities. And what is the answer for a divorce? Because we have lots of kids and we don't want to get rid of them. Well, we can think of federalism as an option. Uh, and people are talking seriously about federalism. But my answer to that question is very simple. Federalism occurs between civilized people. I don't see any here. Thank you. With that note, <laughs> what I'm going to do is move on to our next panelist. Um, and of course, uh, after we have our next panelist, Dr. Sanjan, and questions to him, then we will come back. And if there is a general discussion, then uh, we'll, we'll have a general discussion about all of these aspects um, comprehensively. Uh, so Dr. Sanjan uh, is a associate professor of history uh, and the director uh, of the Armenian Research Center at the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, he has been uh, prominently writing about things Armenian, uh, specifically his research, uh, his thesis and so on have been uh, about uh, Turkey and her Arab neighbors, but he has uh, invested a lot of his times to specifically um, the Armenians in the Middle East. Specifically, lately, he has been closely studying Armenians uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, pass on the mic to Dr. Arasanjan for his presentation. Dr. Sanjan. Uh, thank you very much, and I will try to speak more with numbers, and I will concentrate on three issues, numbers, political elite, and the short-term prospects of uh, the community in the next few days. Now, how many Armenians, this issue has come up again, and probably what I will say will 
put more context to the numbers. There were very few Armenians on the territory of modern Lebanon before 1921, and the mass arrival begins after the Ankara Agreement of October 1921, when the French agreed to withdraw from Kilikia, the areas that were hit very hard by the earthquake a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those Armenians who come into Lebanon and Syria receive Lebanese and citi citizenship in the winter and spring of 1925, the first few months of the year, uh, based on the provisions of the Treaty of Lausanne of 1923. And uh, as soon as that process is over, the French hold the first community-wide census in Lebanon, and the results of them are, were published in early 1927. And at that time, there were almost 33,000 Armenians in Lebanon, and they were constituted about the 5.5% of the population. Lebanon has only had one census in its modern history, and counting is a very dangerous ish thing in Lebanon and politically very volatile. And at that time, of course, the numbers were there, and we see that according to that census, uh, Armenian Orthodox, that is the Armenian Apostolics, they called Orthodox in Lebanon, constituted 3.3% of the population of Lebanon, the Armenian Catholic 0.7%, while the evangelicals, the, the Armenians and the Arab-speaking evangelicals are not divided in Lebanon as a community, they were together 0.9%. And after that, we can see that the number of Armenians is growing, even after 10,000 Armenians moved to Soviet Armenia in 1946-1947, up until the year 1975, which is the high point. Whatever you read or hear, uh, in 1975, there were probably up to 200,000 Armenians. Certainly not more, probably a little less. And this included also the migrants from Palestine and Syria. And those who came from Syria were in tens of thousands. So any higher estimate that you may hear is just guesswork, and none of the serious sources of 1975 ever claimed that the number of Armenians was higher than 200,000. So this is the high point with which we have to, and even in this 200,000, maybe only about 150, 160,000 of them at most had Lebanese citizenship. So that's important. We don't know because after 1956, the Lebanese government has not even published records of how many people hold Armenian citizenship. I will now talk about uh, situations where we have, for example, unofficial figures. And this, unof this unofficial figure came about in, 19, uh, in 2006 uh, it, in an article. It was promised that it would become a book and it never became a book. And we see that here, this is the number of Armenians who hold Lebanese citizenship in the year 2006. So among those who hold citizenship, uh, the uh, Orthodox are down to 2.27 from 3.3, the Catholics to 0.5, and the Evangelicals as a whole to 0.47. But what is more problematic, look at the others. If we only count those below the age 20, they're only 0.9 instead of 2.3. 27. Between ages 21 and 40, they're 1.49. And over the age of 61, they are 5.41. This doesn't mean that it's an aging society. It just confirms what Professor Keshishian said a few months earlier, that many people move out of the country. They remain on the uh, voters register. They don't record any new birth in their country. And according to Lebanese law, they remain on the uh, voter register until the age of 100 then they are immediately dropped out unless you write a petition uh, to stay on that register. So essentially, there are lots of dead people who are still counted among those who hold Lebanese citizenship. And this is true for many other communities as well. But of course, among the Armenians, that's a very huge chunk. And based on the same principle, a very respected Lebanese statistics agency published these results for the year 2018. And you see that the Lebanese passport holders among Armenians have declined from one, uh, 2018 to 2006. Most of this, as I think, is because of uh, emigration much earlier rather than emigration during these 12 years of uh, in between these two uh, statistical collections and publications. So technically now, 
uh, over 110,000 people in the year 2018 hold Lebanese citizenship, but a large number of them are outside the country, and probably some of them are already dead, and their deaths are not reported to the Lebanese government. And so this is it. And here, of course, you have the issue of Armenians on the voters register, which shows how uh, uh, gradually uh, the, the percentage is shrinking. Over the years, as the total number of eligible voters has uh, increased from 2.5 million to 3.9 million, the number of Armenian uh, Orthodox and Catholic voters has remained stuck. In the end, new births are being canceled out by those who have immigrated and gradually are coming out of the voters register uh, in general. And if we look at the uh, participation of Armenians, in the Lebanese elections, which gives some sort of an indication, while the Lebanese participation rate has fluctuated between 40 and 55 percent in the last few elections, the Armenian situation has been largely static uh, in, in, in that sense, which also means that there are a lot of people on the voters register who uh, actually do not vote simply because they are not in the country. Uh, I have checked this. We cannot say that uh, among those Armenians who are living in Lebanon, absenteeism is higher than other sect uh, other communities in the country. So Armenians are as active during the elections as their non-Armenian neighbors. Simply, they are not in the country to vote for it. Even by shipping in voters uh, from the different areas, actually hasn't made much of a difference. A lot of that happened happened, of course, in 2009, and that's why we have that high 55%. Unfortunately, the main place where the Armenians vote, the region of Mudawar in Beirut, there was no election race at that time, so we cannot really compare dates. Uh, and uh, in a way, in the recent election, there was a little count of a downturn as well, but not very dramatic uh, in any case. So, as I said, most of the emigration has happened during the Civil War years, and uh, it is the actually uh, the consequence of that that we are really feeling in the Lebanese politics. Now, numbers are one thing, but who is actually an Armenian in Lebanon is another issue. Yeah, in Lebanon, being an Armenian or any other member of a community is not a matter of choice. You have to be born into a community. You are registered according to your dad's community. And ultimately, you need that uh, in order to exercise many of your civil and political rights. For many of these things, of course, you should have some kind of a permission from your own community, a document from your religious head uh, in order to be able to enjoy a certain right, whether civil or political. Conversion is permitted in Lebanon, but it's not very common and is usually frowned upon by others in the same community. So actually, if you convert politic, uh, for political reasons, and some Armenian politicians have converted for political reasons, it's usually not taken uh, very uh, lightly. Uh, we have uh, Catholic Armenians converting to Orthodoxy or, and a Protestant Armenian converting to uh, Orthodoxy in, in, in our, uh, among the list of our ministers and deputies in the past few decades. And uh, for the Lebanese government, any Armenian who is registered as Armenian is Armenian. But Armenians have their own understanding that in order to be really to some extent Armenian, you have to have regular contact with one of the three Armenian churches and also close ties with one of the country's many organizations, Armenian organizations, whether political, uh, cultural, sporting, etc. And to some extent also getting involved as much as possible with the Armenian school network. This has been the traditional understanding of actually living your Armenianness. What is changing that there are declines from this, uh, pro, uh, from this uh, perspective in recent decades. The percentage of so-called mixed marriages is on the rise, so much on the rise that official records are never uh, published by the church because they will see that to be embarrassing. Uh, and mixed marriage usually means an Armenian marrying another Arabic speaking Christian. There are very few marriages with Muslims, although there are, but not as many as those with the Christian community. Uh, and 
the, the down enrollment in Armenian community schools, we're going to have a separate slide for that very soon. Uh, and most Armenian parents now, no adult parents now prefer to send their children into Catholic or evangelical missionary schools. And the major reason is that this we are going to live in this country. In this country, our children need connections, and it's better for our children to be classmates with the children of the uh, strong and powerful in the country, and that will help them in the future. I, I know one of my classmates said sending an Armenian ch ch your child to an Armenian school is as if you're sending it to an orphanage politically speaking. Uh, the number of Armenians who can speak, let alone write their ancestral language, is gradually diminishing. And we now have a community where there are lots of Armenians who cannot speak Armenian, something which was not thinkable very much a few decades back. These are the numbers of the schools. At its height, when there were supposed to be 200,000 Armenians in Lebanon, there were only 21,000 Armenians attending Armenian community schools. And this was a very low number in that moment as well, which people did not actually appreciate. Really, if there were 200,000, at least the number of school children should have been close to 40,000. But even now we have, and the last numbers I could get was from 2019, there are only 19 Armenian schools and only 5,500 kids are enrolled in those schools. So a, de a decline of over 75%. Percent, And this will continue as parents who do not know Armenian are more likely to send their children into non-Armenian schools uh, in general. And then we can have this very classical case uh, prior to these elections when one of the candidates who runs and won one of the seats allocated to the Armenian community told in an interview, I am Armenian only on my ID card. Ana Armeni Albita Abbas is the way was something which Jihad Pakraduni said. And Jihad Pakraduni actually uh, uh, got 3% of the votes of the Armenians in that constituency. So at least 3% of the Armenians have no problem for voting uh, as their candidate, a person running for the Armenian community who says, I am Armenian on my ID card only. In the same constituency, uh, we have this result. And Beirut 1 is very important because uh, four of the Armenian seats are in this constituency and we have the largest concentration of voters. So probably it has a large pool to show voting tendencies. Of the 8,052 Armenians who cast preferential votes in this election, 62.7% uh, voted for candidates nominated by the Armenian Revolutionary Federation and the Hanchagian party, that is the Tashdag and Hanchagian parties. 71.1% supported other Armenian candidates who were not actually sponsored by these two parties because the Ramgavas were officially not presenting any candidates. There is a breakaway Ramgavar faction which uh, actually said in, in a way that uh, they support some other candidate, but that's a very difficult way to measure them. And sorry, they will also uh, argue that we are not the breakaway, the other ones are breakaway. In a way, the party is divided. And 20% of the Armenians voted other Christian candidates in the constituency because there are no Muslims getting elected from Beirut 1. These results are quite consistent with the results four years earlier. In 2018, the, the ratio was 58.9%, 19%, and 22%. So we have roughly stayed to in that kind of situation. We can just say that 60% of the Armenian voters uh, still support the traditional parties, 20% uh, are looking for other Armenian candidates, and 20% are ready to vote for other Christian non-Armenian candidates, at least in Beirut 1. And look at now those people who are involved. Uh, the E and the F here, of course, are those who were elected and those who failed. And among those who failed, I have mentioned the two candidates who were also uh, nominated by the Armenian parties. The candidates by the Armenian parties, Terzian, Matosian, Malian, and Melkonian, got 88, 89, 80, and 81 percent of their votes from Armenian voters. 
uh, which basically means that Armenian candidates have very little appeal outside the Armenian community or Armenian parties have very little appeal outside the community. Look at those Armenians who managed to get elected and fill the seats without being supporters of any uh, Armenian political party. Kaluzian got uh, 800, sorry, 827 votes from Armenians and evangelicals, but that's only 21% of his, of his tally. And Jihad Pakladuni only got 11% of his tally in a way. Uh, and Pola Yakubian, who is supposed to be the most famous one, got 30% of this, which basically means that these candidates have who have a lot of following outside the Armenian community are not still very appealing to the Armenian voters as well, because in some way they are very different. At the end of the elections, I had calculated, and I've written that on Facebook, that the total vote received by the all Armenian candidates across the country from Armenian non-Armenian voters was down by 24% uh, in four years. Now, after careful study, we see that this has to be, in a way, be very careful. Half of that decline is the decline of the vote or by one candidate who is currently the leader of the ARF in Lebanon, Hagop Pakraduni. And it's very interesting that while he lost something like 2,000 votes in the same constituency compared to last time, down for 7,100 7, to 4,900 something, uh, the, the percentage spread of his votes is the same. In both cases, he won 68 to 69% of his vote from Armenians and 31 to 32% from non-Armenians which basically that the decline of 2,000 votes was equally spread among Armenian voters and non-Armenian voters. In the case of the non-Armenian voters, that could be because the Tashdak party changed alliance. Instead of running with the more popular uh, uh, free patriotic movement, they went along with Michel Elmur, uh, a local political boss, yeah, and also the even weaker uh, Syrian Social National Party. That may be a reason. But what is important is that probably uh, hundreds of Armenians vote, did not vote for Hagop Pakraduni while they had voted for him four years earlier. Uh, I have some guesses, but since it's not really studied as much, we don't know. If we look at the other case, for example, of the Hanchagians, while their total vote is down, the candidate won much more Armenian votes this time than four years earlier. The votes of the Hanchagians are down because they didn't have their ally, the Mustakbal movement, asking its Sunni supporters in Beirut 1 when there is no Sunni candidate to vote for the Hanchagian party. So in that sense, uh, instead of, in addition to being a gradual decline, the candidacy of Mr. Pakraduni probably was an issue which has to be studied separately before making broader judgments. I don't have the full answers for this, but I'm just pointing out that this is a very important factor when one person's numbers really make a lot of effect on the overall numbers in general. This will come to this idea that the nationwide protests, which Professor Keshian used the word saura or revolution for it, did not have in the short run any much effect on Armenian political preferences. I've used the term, they did not chip away at the traditional support base of the traditional parties. Uh, and uh, I've also talked about the limitedness of their others. Now, for course, I am going to focus on those candidates, this new breed of Armenian politicians who are becoming famous on the Lebanese political scene, but are not that popular yet among Armenian voters. And these are, of course, much more visible on television. Uh, in a way, than traditional Armenian parties. One reason I think the traditional parties do not want to appear much on television is that traditionally they won't, don't want to take sides. Armenians have tried, uh, have liked to live like, you know, keep low kind of thing. I will not use the word ostrich because that has a negative connotation, but they thought that the best uh, strategy, and that's a very difficult kind of tradition uh, to break. It has gone down generation after generation, right? and it has even affected 
people like me who are not politicians and people do not want us to express opinions in public, which may be very controversial, even in our own academic work. So that's something that we should not distance from one to another. So Paula Yakubian comes first. Relatively, she's more popular than the others. I told you that her 30% of her vote came from Armenians. Uh, she was briefly a member of one of those new parties, the Sabah party, but she left very quickly. Lori Haitayan is a, another interesting thing in the sense that she didn't run this time. Uh, in, 200, in 2018, he had received very limited number of votes, but 37% of that had come from uh, Armenia. But to be sure, the issue of even trying to lure Lori to run on the Tashnag uh, list in 2018 had been very briefly discussed according to my thing. So in a way, the Tashtak party does not consider her to be too far away from her. But what is interesting is that Lori is now the leader of a political party in Lebanon, which has two uh, representatives on, in the Lebanese parliament elected from another constituency. There are a Druze and also a Maronite, which is a very interesting feature. Prior to uh, the Lebanese civil war, uh, there were, of course, a significant number of Armenians in the Lebanese Communist Party. They never reached high positions only because of common term dictates that the leadership should also be from the Arab majority. So to some extent, they were discriminated against uh, in that sense. But since the end of communist rule in Armenia, there are almost no Armenians left in the Lebanese Communist Party. Why Armenians become, became communists, that's a very interesting issue to be uh, studied later on. The Falange party had some Armenians in its leadership, like Joseph Shader and also Karim Pakraduni, who was Jihad Pakraduni's father. Uh, but in essence, of course, they're, uh, uh, again, they, we cannot say that they were exceptions rather than the rule. It's very interesting that when Joseph Shader filled the Armenian Catholic uh, seat for many, many years, uh, he was never challenged by the Tashnak party. The Tashnak party never ran a candidate against Joseph Shadr. Non-Tashnaks did, but all the time they ended up losing in a way. But after the end of the civil war, there was this brief period where Tashnak party dominated everything. And since I'm working on a history of the Leban Armenian community's political history in Lebanon, we can say that one track of the history is how the Tashnak party came to dem dominate Lebanese politics from very modest background in the 1920s into total control of, of almost all institutions uh, uh, up to during and in the first years after the civil war. But since then, it has failed in its ability to monopolize the ministerial and, and also parliamentary positions. And a number of Armenians have filled those positions by representing other political factions. I'm not talking about independence here. Uh, the Dashnaks lost the Armenian evangelical seat and probably they will not recover it again. Uh, some 20 years ago, and also some of the administrative positions allocated to the Armenians, which are usually filled by candidates approved by the Tashnak party. Those, of course, probably will be challenged by other Christian parties who would have now devout uh, you know, members who are of Armenian background to fill those seats, and we may have these kind of people coming in. And based on this, if we look at the Tashnak party rhetoric in the last two elections, the Tashnak party no longer sees the Hanchagians and the Ramgavars as its rivals, which was the case for many, many decades in a way. Today, it sees what it's called in 2018 Armenians for a single day and what it called in the 2022 elections or those who are outside community circles as its main uh, antagonists. In the elections to 2022, not only the party said that don't go and vote for these people who do not represent the Armenian community. They are Armenians by name only, and they are not part of the community, but also uh, the Catholicos and the prelates also joined in the same kind of uh, statement and rhetoric, which for me was a bit controversial for a church to say that one of my members is does not represent my community, but that's another issue. So just finishing up, 
I agree that there is a renewed desire for emigration, and a lot of Armenians are also among those who have emigrated or desperately want to emigrate. Uh, that's a pan-Lebanese issue, as uh, Professor Keshishian said. And the most acute period of Armenian desire for emigration was after the Beirut port explosion and before the war in Karabakh some six weeks later. To be very sarcastic, the war in Armenia came, was a blessing for the Armenian community leadership in Lebanon because it lessened the tide of people to travel to Armenia. Uh, and this is something new. During the civil war, thousands and tens of thousands of Armenians left, but only a handful of them left to Soviet Armenia. Today, we have definitely hundreds and probably a few thousand Armenians who have moved from Lebanon to Armenia. Just a walk in downtown Yerevan, looking at the names of the eateries in, in Lebanon from, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Beirut Cafe, Lebanese Cafe, into something even Al Derwendi Cafe, which is very interesting, you know, a, a, a TV personal, a character personality having a cafe in his own name in downtown Yerevan. It shows that there is a kind of a presence. And we know that the community uh, leadership is against any kind of migration. While not said very openly, they are also discouraging migration even to Armenia. However, uh, experience tells us that decisions and I don't know, exhortations by the party leadership will not have any effect. During the Lebanese civil war, the Tashnak parties began to expel all these members who actually were leaving. A few hundred were expelled as far as I know, only and at the 100th anniversary of the party, all of them to be pardoned. And uh, then many of them were not even interested to come back to the party fold as well. In the end, people decide based on their own family choices and strategies, and uh, these kind of uh, talk they would not really make change. Within this context, of course, just trying to sum, uh, uh, sum, sum it up, the Armenian numbers are diminishing, yes. Uh, there are more attractive places for Armenian youth to travel to uh, in order to show their talents uh, than Lebanon. And uh, this idea that Armenians themselves don't to be seen as pack, uh, uh, active actors on the Lebanese theoretical scene because they consider that to be dangerous for the safety and security of the community. These are the reasons that Armenians are at the very receiving end of the crisis. They have no role in solving the crisis, but like everybody else in Lebanon, they are, of course, under the brunt of feeling all the... Uh, bad effects that the crisis is affecting. And in the short run, uh, I don't know what the community can do except to try to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjan. Uh, the question I have uh, is the following. Uh, as you discuss the numbers, uh, and specifically the numbers of uh, Armenian students in Armenian schools, uh, you obviously were basing a certain trajectory. You're basically suggesting that there is a decline in the numbers, and therefore this uh, talks about the uh, decline of Armenian life in general in, in Lebanon because of emigration, because of other factors. Uh, and the question that uh, I have is uh, pretty much in the same vein as the question I was asking Dr. Keshishian earlier, uh, that as we discuss these phenomena, uh, and these are, of course, relative, uh, relative to uh, a certain uh, threshold that at one point the numbers of students was, let's say, 19,000, now they're 55 hundred and so on and so forth, aren't we being a little bit too harsh on this community where if we were to compare, for example, uh, the Los Angeles community where the least number of Armenians that anybody has put forth uh, is about half a million. And some people even suggest that you have uh, close to a million Armenians in LA or in California. 
Uh, and uh, here, uh, our army and schools have uh, a body, a student body of maybe what, 5,500 or so. So whereas Armenians in Lebanon, 150,000, have 5,500 going to Armenian schools, um, a community of half a million or more has only that much in Armenian schools in LA. So where is, where am, uh, uh, is, is this just um, in, in trying to um, suggest that going to Armenian schools is somewhat uh, an important definition uh, in the case of Lebanon, but not in the case of, let's say, LA? It, it has been very important, and there is one very, very important aspect in Lebanon, which probably has to be changed at some stage. In our in Lebanon, Armenian life is in Armenian, full stop. Uh, and if once you stop understanding Armenian, there is very little that you can actually have on things Armenian. Uh, no publications in Arabic. You have to I'll probably read what is published by the Armenians in France or Armenians in America in order to know what's going on, no public events in those languages, et cetera, which also makes it difficult for the local non-Armenian people to come and attend those events. And this has been a very important day. But also one thing is very important because Lebanon's role, those schools, and not only the Lebanon schools, but add to that the schools in Aleppo and the Melkonian Institute uh, in Cyprus have provided America with its Armenian school teachers. I don't know how many graduates of Armenian schools in America or in France have ended up being instructors of Armenian language. Because as far as I know, we have one here school in Detroit, yeah, where I don't think anybody who graduates from the school will be able to teach Armenian, probably not able also to write a full page in Armenian uh, in that sense. So the, uh, the level of instruction of Armenian was very dif uh, different. And that once it goes down, there comes up this issue of, you know, what to do with it. In the same way as the churches, especially in the Echmiadzin diocese, are being filled in with uh, clergy coming from Eastern Armenia, uh, the Jerusalem seminary serving mostly Eastern Armenian seminarians, etc., in a way that is become uh, that will also become an issue for the Armenian schools uh, in the diaspora. And probably in the future, uh, if people will be teaching Armenian as a second language outside the Middle East, it will be Eastern Armenian rather than maintaining Western Armenian. I know some people, for example, in America who grow up in the, in the field of Armenian studies, when they want to study Armenian, they go and study Eastern Armenian which would have probably made their grandparents very angry because their grandparents were all Western Armenian speakers. But this is, in a way, an important cultural shift that is happening, uh, and uh, its repercussions will not be only felt in, uh, in Lebanon. Moreover, those people who are migrating to Armenia are those who are usually the most committed to Armenian causes. Uh, and uh, which means that that second group of Armenians who feel themselves more Christian Lebanese and only then Armenian, uh, starting from politics into on other issues, which have less interest in Armenian issues outside Lebanon, they will start predominating. And one thing which made the Armenian community different from the other Christian communities, except the Maronites, was the fact that Armenians want to keep a separate political uh, presence in Lebanon. The Greek Orthodox and the Greek Catholic communities, much larger than Armenians, are essentially all members of various political parties who are all without exception, actually led by Maronites. In that sense, they don't have any political persona as a community of their own. And that's why writing the history of Lebanon, you write about the Maronites, you write about the Sunnis and Shias, to some extent, you try to write about the Druze because their leader is desperate to make sure that they are be counted. And that's why he has a very kind of unpredictable policy, etc., in order to be relevant all the time. Armenians were much smaller. The aspirations of the Tashnak party were not as great as those of the Jumblat clan, 
among the Druze, but they had lots of similarities. But those numbers are now coming down. And ultimately, as we see, more and more Armenians will be looking towards the leaders of Christian political factions as their sources of inspiration. The Arabic word is al marjaiya rather than to the political clubs of the uh, Tashnak or the Hunchak parties. And that is becoming in a way. I was talking to one of the Hunchagian party leaders many years ago. He said the number of Armenians uh, who are members of the Lebanese forces or the number of Armenians who are members of the General House Free Patriotic Movement are as many as those who are Hunchagians. And so, which means that the Tashnak party is the next in the sense, of course, the Tashnak party is much bigger than the Hunchagian party in Lebanon, but that's also what is really uh, shifting. And we have to uh, uh, just observe what is happening. Okay, uh, so so do you see, I mean, uh, Dr. Keshishan ended his talk with the call for relevance, right? Uh, how that relevance can come about is, of course, to be defined. Uh, he, he touched upon some aspects, but uh, uh, the logic, as I understand it, is to become relevant in Lebanese life as all uh, is also the ability to penetrate uh, Lebanese politics. Of course, both of you gave examples where a lot of the Armenian deputies uh, uh, are not on TV, are not in interviews and so on and so forth. So, but isn't there a correlation of um, an erosion of Armenian cultural identity? And I don't care how you define that. I mean, in other words, an Armenian who goes to and, and stays true to his Armenian or her Armenian identity, but goes to Lebanese universities, he or she may not uh, be able to speak Armenian very well, but may very uh, may feel very much Armenian, and so and has a much bigger potential of becoming relevant on the Lebanese scene. Uh, therefore, do you see a conflict here from the traditional way that we have approached these matters and uh, and how? We've looked at the Armenian community as almost like a ghettoish uh, uh, reality versus uh, another reality, which is the new one. And is it evolving or is it pure erosion and, and, and there's no coming back from it? Uh, this is much more than Armenians who don't speak Ar uh, Armenian. It's more about that generation of Armenians, including myself, whose Armenianness does not necessarily pass through one of the political parties. Look, I grew up in a family where it was strictly forbidden for me to go to any club. It was my dad's decision. And he used to say, just tell me, my son, what have the parties done? It was a very extreme case, except by turning one Armenian against another. I don't want you to grow up hating other Armenians. Uh, etc. Now we have a lot of people uh, who are very successful in their fields of life, yeah, and ultimately the party leaderships are not making use of them. I, if I can be more critical, I said they are afraid of these people, yeah, because these people are very successful and sometimes very smart individuals. So essentially, when it comes to decision making, the methods that used to work in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and maybe 60s, when these traditions were set, who is a good party activist? Who deserves a decision-making role in a party structure or whatever? And of course, Indian parties dictate who will go to the uh, church assemblies in that sense, et cetera, is actually being confined to a certain number of people. Uh, having multitude of strategies to bring in different types of Armenians together around certain issues, etc. This is something that the church should do in the first place, or the churches should do in the first place. And uh, then, of course, the political parties should do it ultimately, as you know, especially when it comes to the Kirikia Catholic state, its room for maneuvering in taking decision making is very limited. Uh, while the 
uh, Catholic and evangelical establishments are in are freer than the than the Armenian uh, Orthodox or Apostolic setup in actually the clergy taking initiatives by themselves. So this has to be a very very important issue, but it will create. A very serious thing. By the way, I just forgot to say that in the in the rest that I have to thank Rupe Nafsharian for helping me with some of the missing data that I put together for all these numbers. He's working for a new publication on the 20, 2022 elections. Uh, I will also come in here and refer to another friend of mine, Raj Chilingirian, who many years ago said something. And I, I'm thinking that trying to encourage Raj that let's talk about this and write more about this. Who is the leader? in this context and in the Armenian communities. Those who control the institutions, and I'm talking here the physical buildings, because all the physical buildings that we have in Lebanon were built up mostly until the 1960s, et cetera. And they are basically controlled by who are now at the top of the parties. If we look at the educational level of those who are uh, taking decisions for the three main political parties, we have a lot of potential outside those narrow circles who can make a difference. But essentially, these people are rarely consulted on any issue uh, in life, etc. And so at some stage, a mentality among those who lead is very, very important. And unfortunately, as I said, the church itself is, according to its regulations and tradition, very limited role in taking initiative in these issues. So ultimately, we're coming to that aspect of how to define who is an Armenian, yeah? And ultimately, to bring those kind of people who do not fit into the traditional mentality, try to help them if 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 it can, to see what their needs are, etc. But essentially, very little of this is being done. There's a joke-like thing. There's a, one school which has lots of Armenians. It is the uh, evangelical school in Lebanon. So much that the number of total of students, uh, I'm told, in that school are bigger, the uh, Armenian school, that any one Armenian school needs in order to survive relatively comfortably if it had that number of students. It is said that many years ago, the principal of that school wanted to introduce extra Armenian courses as electives for its students. Very open, non Armenian persons suggesting. Many of the Armenian parents, I'm told, oppose that, that it will be a burden for their children. That essentially you don't need Armenian in order to succeed in Lebanese life. And so that kind of mentality, how to challenge that, et cetera, is very, very important. Is our leadership who take the ultimate decisions ready to be open-minded, uh, to consider uh, new options, etc. I'm not sure about that. Okay. And so, but uh, just just one comment in defense of uh, the Armenian political parties. Let us just say that for years and years, uh, uh, and the last ten or so years, notwithstanding, uh, the parties basically acted as a, sort of a, a government. Uh, of Armenian things in general, and even especially during the civil war, where the community was very much left on its own, uh, the Armenian political parties uh, came forth and uh, took care of uh, certain needs of the community, specifically, of course, uh, uh, from a security point of view. So we should also uh, be fair about that. And uh, just to go on to a question by Harut Ronozian, where he says, uh, how uh, close are Armenia and Lebanese Armenian relations? I'm assuming Armenia, specifically the government of Armenia means. Uh, and why is repatriation not encouraged by, by both sides? So uh, the, the, of course, what he's referring to is the Lebanese uh, Armenian leadership may not be promoting repatriation back to Armenia uh, or basically emigration to Armenia, uh, but uh, we don't see much being done 
uh, from Armenia's side uh, to encourage such repatriation. And uh, Harut should uh, excuse me if I'm putting words in his mouth, but I'm trying to create the context for discussion. Uh, uh, we can just to add what the Armenian parties tried to do and the Tashnak party basically managed to do in Burchamut only in during the civil war was also not exceptional to the Armenians in the sense all other political parties in their respective fiefdoms yeah, did the same things from right. collecting taxes to forced uh, conscription let's use the put the words in etc uh, uh, into providing services etc etc in, in that sense it was not different uh, now uh, second thing how close are relations i think lebanon is such a weak country uh, and i don't think it, is, it does matter i have talked at least to one of the deputies uh, who says that we are able to do more and this was a few years back if the armenian foreign ministry tells us in advance what to do that we are going to this or that conference, that there is a, this kind of, a, let's say, and it, it was basically we're talking about the organization of Islamic states, yeah, where Lebanon is still a member, yeah, that ultimately, if we know in advance, we can work with the foreign ministry, or at least Lebanon can abstain or whatever. And a few times they have managed, but sometimes the response has not been well. The Lebanese government, of course, is very careful. Uh, that opposition to a government in Armenia does not go beyond certain bounds. And at least I remember two cases when the Armenian embassy in Lebanon was going to be opened in the 1990s and the foreign minister was going to come to Lebanon from a meeting in Istanbul using a Turkish Havayollah uh, when the Tashnak party actually t were, were called for a huge rally in the Buchamud soccer stadium, yeah, against it, and the Lebanese government actually banned that in the last moment. Uh, when President Sarkisian was going to come to Lebanon during the protocol, something unprecedented happened. Uh, the Armenian the Lebanese president called separately the three political party leaders to one-to-one one -one meetings, and nothing was, of course, disclosed. But since one of those who participated was my classmate, and he's now dead, Vasquez, uh, because of COVID. I, told, I asked him, I asked him, what did the president say? He said, he just said that, you know that you are angry, but please remember that Armenia is a country friendly to Lebanon, and we want our, our uh, president of Armenia to feel respected in this country. So this is technically. The issue here of the genocide thing, the Lebanese government has always responded and gone to all major events that the Armenian government has called. But the unfortunate thing that uh, Christian-only delegations have gone. For many, many years, Armenians in Lebanon have stopped inviting Muslims to April the 24th commemorations. The reason, I've asked them, and this is the answer. We know that the Sunnis are not going to come in advance. We don't want to put too much pressure on them by inviting the Shis and the Druze, because if they come, that will be very, very evident. So it's better just to lead on. On April 24th, we see many, many Lebanese politicians expressing sympathy with the Armenians. 98% of them are Christian deputies, plus two political parties which do not have a political coloring. One is the Communist Party, and the other is the Syrian Social National Party, the Qawmi Suri, as they are known. Uh, for most Sunnis, uh, knowing that Turkey will be unhappy, uh, in a way, this has become a very much taboo. The weakening of the leftist politics, nationalist politics among the Muslim community has made it more difficult for the Armenians to talk about the genocide, something which was very much possible until the, uh, the Lebanese civil war at the height of the Palestinian nationalistic movement or whatever. Uh, I don't blame the Armenian government on this issue. I know that many times the Armenian government in recent years, after 2019, was ready to announce packages. And it was asked by the leadership in Lebanon, I will not give names, uh, I put uh, uh, not to announce those packages. What can Armenian government do if it, the message from the Lebanese Armenian community leadership is please don't do this? Should it go and say openly, 
I cannot do it. I'm saying it because this is some of what has it had, what has it happened. But ultimately, people are going by themselves uh, if they do. Those who are successful are uh, by the phone telling their people that they're very happy. Those who are not successful are returning. So in that sense, uh, I know that some of the leader, uh, some of the children of those leaders are now there. They have businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, the editor of the newspaper Zartong has a business in Armenia. Part time, he edits. Uh, sometimes he edits the newspaper sitting in Armenia. So ultimately, it's the economics and other issues that will decide, rather than what the community leadership wants. Uh, uh, Armenians in Lebanon have a hundred ways of connecting with Armenia, starting from watching television, yeah, going to the internet and reading because they know Armenian more than in other countries to read the Armenian stuff, yeah. Uh, they have all their friends in Armenia with whom they talk every day, etc. So ultimately, that is not really needed. If Armenia wants to attract more Armenians, if it does the job of those who are going to make life easier for them, something with at least this government is trying to do, a, a new uh, structure is going to come up within a few months, this, you know, Hamargman or Integrman uh, Center, etc. That will happen. Uh, and also the issue is, what can you do in Armenia? There are certain fields if there are your fields, you can go and work in Armenia. There are other fields where immigration is will not give you to any prospects. I will tell you a story without giving name. One of the teachers from my school, she married one of the girls of the higher class. Well, he was a young teacher. Now they have grandkids. And I bumped into them uh, on the street in my last visit to Beirut. And they recognized me. She recognized me before I recognized her, etc. And we started talking and she said, my husband and I self dearly want to go and to live in Armenia. The problem is that our son is a physician. He went, looked for a good job in Armenia. He couldn't find it. That's why he did not go. And so we are not going here because our son is here. So ultimately, if Armenia's economy is more vibrant and if physicians can go and find jobs or whatever, etc., or can set up profitable private businesses, et cetera, private clinics, things away. So essentially it's the economy in Armenia. Other than that, uh, not only Armenians, but I know that many Arabic Christians who go to Armenia and we will tell them there's a country when there's only one mosque and everybody is Christian. For them, it's such an attractive place in a way. I know many people who come after tourists and said, you're fools that you have such a good country and you're staying here. Well, of course, tourist is tourism, yeah? But ultimately, uh, this is it. So Armenia is sorting out its own security issues and also its economic issues will only help migration. And that's the most practical way to go ahead with that. Okay, thank you. So we've been uh, at this for a good two hours and we're gonna try and bring uh, this panel to the close. Uh, uh, however, I'm going to uh, uh, ask Dr. Keshishian um, to, if he wants to comment about this last topic or uh, a topic of his choosing. And then I'm also going to ask Dr. Um, Samar if she wants to uh, comment, and then we'll wrap this up. Well, very, very good. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Keshishan, first, please go ahead and then. Uh, very briefly, uh, we're running out of time, very briefly. I think that when it comes to geostrategy, what attracts countries like Armenia and Lebanon is really the geography where they are. Unfortunately, both of these countries are surrounded by very powerful entities. Uh, whatever they do, they are victims more than they are actors that can determine their own destinies and their fates. For us as Armenians, I think what is important is not only for us to survive, whether in Lebanon or, or in Armenia, but to actually have uh, outlooks, we have visions, we need to have visions as to what is it that we want to do? What, what is it that we, earlier Hago Panosian, mentioned the fact that we are surviving and we are doing great and ARPA is doing a great deal of work in Armenia. Uh, and, and the diaspora has done tremendous things in Armenia as well. But let's be honest about this. 
How many Armenians are there in Armenia today? But the majority of Armenians are living outside. They are in the diaspora. And a tiny portion in Lebanon, mostly in the West, all over the world, of course. But obviously, what we need to do, we really need to think about what is it that we want to accomplish as a, as a people? Or are we destined, like so many other peoples, to eventually assimilate in the countries where we are? And not only not even not, even, not to be able to speak or read the language or, or write the language, but to essentially uh, satisfy ourselves that we are remaining a Christian nation. I'm not sure how long that's gonna last, to be honest. Sorry to be so pessimistic. Hey, uh, Dr. Risa, do you have any comments? Uh, thank you all. And I just want to say that I really learned a lot. And I believe that the presence and effectiveness of Armenians in Lebanon is very important. And I hope that their presence survives. And um, uh, I'm not very, very skeptical in that area. I hope um, Armenians can play a bigger role. And they, I do believe that they will contribute to, um, to this current, to the solution of this current crisis. That's, um, I hope to end it in a positive uh, message um, to, to try to kind of give this hope to all of us that Lebanon will get back and Armenians will play a role in the solution. Uh, before passing it on to uh, Dr. Panosian and uh, have him conclude this, what I'd like to say is that this panel and such examinations, uh, what they, uh, impose upon us is, uh, and, and a couple of the panelists, all of the panelists actually refer to uh, to the need for more strategic planning. And I think as Armenians, given our limited resources, our modest resources, both from Armenia's side and the communities, whether they're being challenged or uh, the challenges that they uh, bring upon themselves, uh, it seems to me that we need more strategy uh, so that events do happen and they will happen, uh, but that we're to a certain extent ahead of the game, that we know what's coming. And uh, especially when these things do happen, these occurrences do happen, uh, caused by geopolitics or, and so on, that we uh, have uh, always a plan B. Uh, in, at this point in time, whether it's uh, in Syria or Lebanon and so on, we have a situation evolving, uh, which is out of our control. But then we have uh, on the one side, uh, the concern of the communities, how to support them, how to make sure that, that they be, uh, stay vibrant and they uh, are secure and so on and so forth, but also uh, if there is going to be any sort of emigration, it behooves us, and, uh, and also this is a task of, of course, the uh, government in Armenia, to make sure that the emigration ultimately is uh, directed uh, to Armenia uh, and not to uh, anywhere else, if, of course, we can help it. I agree with Dr. Sanjan that families make uh, their moves based on their own priorities. But of course, there is something to be said about uh, uh, the recipient of that emigration. Uh, where that emigration uh, ends up is immigration to another country and the immigration policy of that uh, host country is very, very important. And so uh, having said that, uh, I pass it on to Dr. Panosian for his concluding remarks uh, and his closure remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Viken, and thank you very much uh, to the panelists, Dr. Isa, Dr. Sanjian, Dr. Keshishian, for your excellent uh, analyses and presentations. And thank you, Jora, for taking care of our technical issues here. And uh, thank you all for attending. Our next uh, event will be on uh, March the 25th, and the topic will be on political entrepreneurship in Armenia. 
this is a new kind of subject that has come up lately, that just as there are uh, scientific entrepreneurship or business entrepreneurship, there's also political entrepreneurs who, who essentially are business people or scientific people, but they enter politics and they do actually become entrepreneurs in politics and change for the better. So that's what we're trying to address uh, in our next panel discussion on the 25th, and you should receive our uh, announcements. And if you like what we are doing, please donate to the ARPA Institute. And thank you very much. We will see you next time.